So uh, my name is uh, Ken Owens. I'm the CTO for Cloud Native Platforms here at Cisco. And um, I want to spend some time today just kind of talking about like how you develop applications in this sort of new cloud native methodology. So um, how many people in here are application developers? Anyone? No? Anybody infrastructure admins or network admins, architects? Yeah. OK. Good. Well, this class is going to be perfect for you because I, I kind of figured Cisco Live, mostly smart architect, admins, network, you know, network gurus are going to be here. So I want to sort of start the first class with kind of like what I consider the important things for you guys to understand and know about this transformation. Um, hopefully in the future there will be more, um, more exercises in these classroom instructions that kind of give you a like, hands-on to some of the configurations on the network and the computing and the clustering side. And so um, this is something we're kind of doing in the DevNet zone, um, kind of starting out with higher level, kind of like 101 type of classes, and then there'll be like a 201 and a 301 to get more deep dives as we go, as we get more interest in, in this area. So um, I just kind of want to talk a little bit first about sort of how do you get ready for this? Um, I kind of feel like this is a big transformation, so you want to sort of like uh, start preparing for it now, start thinking about how you're going to get involved and help the business and help your developers be successful as they make this transition. Um, and then I, I want to spend a little bit of time on the impact to your infrastructure because there's a big impact that you, if you haven't looked at this yet, you may not realize it, but there's a lot of changes probably going to happen in the infrastructure layer, especially around the way you think about configuration, the way you think about managing change within your environment, and the way you think about applications being deployed and being, um, you know, the, the life cycle of the application management that you're doing today. And then um, I want to give you a little bit of insight into how businesses are thinking about defining the services and how they're deploying their business services and how that, what that means to you. Um, then I was going to spend just a few minutes on like sort of what open source is about and why is it being talked about yet again. Like we thought Linux took care of the whole open source discussion years ago, but um, there's a big change and a big shift going back to leveraging open source, um, more of the, the smaller projects to less, um, less mature, less, you know, grow, you know, less stable projects, if you will. And so how, how do you as a, you know, and you think about your day job, how do you ma maintain and manage compliance and controls of all these new things coming in? And then I have like a little video demo of, of sort of like what this looks like. Um, and so, first of all, what is cloud native, right? So many of you have probably heard different definitions. Um, I, I gave sort of two definitions here. The first one is the one I sort of think of coming from a, a kind of a, a network security architect background, right? Um, it, it's really software engineering that is driving the new sort of this cloud native methodology. And it's not really anything new from, from that standpoint when you look at things like SOA that people tried to do many, many years ago, right? It's the business developers have always tried to get their applications from, from concept to production as quick as they can. And so it's, it's not really anything new from the standpoint that they just have to get it out quicker, and by making it smaller and more concise, they have less moving parts, and those parts that do need to move can, can scale up independently of each other. And so it's, it's really no different than when, when Cisco started doing virtual routing within our physical routers, right? It was just a way to sort of take a, a big process, bunch of processors that you have and break up the workload into smaller pieces so that you can then manage multiple different workloads. And so, um, so a big part of that is sort of just looking at these different um, software engineering pro, you know, principles, uh, taking things like agile development and, and putting that into practice into the day-to-day -day deployment of applications into production systems. Um, and then open source, I think, has played a very big role in this as well because the speed of innovation, the speed of change that the businesses are trying to address today, you can't really go to a big vendor and say, hey, I want to buy this software package from you because then you need to change something a month or two later and you have to wait for the business that you bought the software from to get it under the roadmap and develop it and test it and roll it out, you know, six to nine months later. And by then you missed your window of opportunity that you were trying to get within. So that's sort of the more general definition. The uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation has defined uh, Cloud Native as containerized, so small package, right? Uh, microservices architecture, which is sort of a 
way of thinking about your applications and your way you develop software is being short-lived and, and distributed in nature, so distributed computing systems. And then distributed orchestration, and that means being able to kind of manage different services and workloads in a distributed manner across multiple locations. And I like to add and manage because you can't really just orchestrate things that happen without managing the changes and managing the stuff that happens around that. So you, I think you have to sort of look at the CNCF definition and add distributed orchestration and management. So as you think about what's happening in the industry and as you're looking at what your day-to-day -day job is about, right? I think uh, it's really important to be in, on board with the vision that the, the enterprise or the business is setting for moving the applications and moving the development processes to cloud native. I think it's important that you over communicate, especially now as you're sort of looking at this journey. Talk with your developers, talk with the different businesses you work with, and try to help be part of that like vision setting and, and how do you help implement the vision that they're setting. Um, if you have a lot of, if you interface with partners and customers, make sure you talk with them and help them understand that you're going on this path and it's going to be bumpy, it's going to take some time, but you're going to make this transformation and you want them to be part of that with you. Um, I think this, this last piece is overlooked a lot in, in talking about cloud native work, but you have to kind of look at your team and you have to make sure that the team you're working with is the right team. And if they're not the right team, it doesn't mean you like, you know, kick them out and say, well, you're not part of this company, right? It's you invest in them. You help them become the right team. You give them the right training. Um, you help them see that they're going to be part of this, this journey. And, and most, of, most of you guys in this room, right, are probably in this state of like, how do I fit in? And I think the, the rule there is you do fit in because you need networking, you need compute, you need security, you need all the things that you always have needed in the infrastructure. It's just the way you implement them is going to be more automated than you've been to po at this point and it's going to be more instrumentation around the observability of what's happening in the network and in the compute environment is more important and more critical now than it was maybe in the past. Um, the other thing is you want to look at kind of the strengths and weaknesses that you have um, across other organizations that you work with too because if, if your job is dependent on other groups working with you, then you need to help those other groups also kind of jump on board and come along on the story with you. And then the last thing is, is sort of understanding the technology better, right? So it's, a lot of us love technology and we kind of jump right in there first and let me play with Kubernetes and tweak all these different parameters. and. And that's always fun to do, but at the same time, um, you need to look at it from, this, from the lens of how am I going to help the business you know, achieve its goals and its objectives and less about what's, what's this new technology and how do I use it, right? So you've got to kind of balance those two things. And then it also will help you kind of look at um, once you know what your skills set is and what the skills of your team are, you can then kind of look at how do I apply this new set of technologies to the skills that my team has and how do I help them grow and understand this new technology better. So then um, when it comes to technology impact, I think that there's a lot of you know, refreshes happening all the time in industry. So as you look at your, your infrastructure, your networking, your compute, your storage, um, most of the vendors at this point in time have a story for cloud native that they're trying to leverage, right? And so it's important that you kind of understand what your vendors are offering. Um, if you're going to do something yourself, it's important to kind of understand what the impact of that's going to be on your existing infrastructure. If you're going to kind of go down an open compute path or a, you know, leverage some of the open source projects for your network, you're going to want to kind of look at how do you manage all of these different risks and, and components. Um, most of the time we talk about continuous integration and the continuous delivery, you're talking about it from the standpoint of software development, right? But I think infrastructure should adopt that same methodology, right? If Right now, it's very costly and time-consuming to go from you know, generation X to generation Y of hardware because it's, it's just very painful in the way that, that hardware upgrades are performed, right? It's more of a, like, take this environment and brownfield it and then bring up a whole new greenfield environment and then move applications over, right? And I think if, as infrastructure architects, we get this concept of, I'm going to build my infrastructure to be sort of a lowest common denominator and I'm going to abstract all the infrastructure components to the highest level I can, then you become kind of part of this new cloud native vision, right? Because now you're managing 
pools of resources with software at, at a different layer than at the physical hardware layer. And that hardware can more easily be swapped out and replaced with other hardware as long as your software layer can manage the abstractions underneath you. Now, obviously, there would be new feature sets that you might be upgrading to get, right? And so those new feature sets may require you to create some more software. But in order to kind of keep this CI CD methodology in mind, you have to write your abstraction layer again for that new feature set. So if vendor A today gives you this new feature set and you want that feature set and you create some software that works with that feature set, don't lock yourself into vendor A's feature set, right? Your, your software is an abstraction layer so that as you provision that hardware today, it, it only works on vendor A, but in the future, if other vendors go down that same path, and it's the right way to do things, and you have your software already written to, to take on this new technology. The other thing I think is important from an infrastructure side of things is to look at what open source investment you should be making, right? Because if, if, um, if your business has said, I'm going to use Kubernetes, or I'm going to use you know, Docker, it's important that you probably, as an infrastructure person, try to join these communities and get involved with them early, right? The longer you sort of say, that's the software guy's job, and I'm not going to learn these new technologies, the more difficult it's going to be for you to kind of help the business make this pivot, right? And so um, jumping into these different projects, learning more about them, contributing to them. Um, it's, it's, if you ever, I don't know if you, any of you guys joined any kind of open source communities. They're not hard to join. Um, they're not hard to get involved in. Um, you do have to kind of attend. The, the organization meetings, they have different like, um, calls and IOC chat stuff going on, and so you want to get involved with it, but the point of it is not so you can kind of go off and not do your day job, it's but to make your day job part of learning these new technologies and then bringing them back into your infrastructure and helping to make your infrastructure more agile and better for the business. I think Automation is sort of an old term that we've all done for the last several years with cloud, right? We've probably automated the heck out of our entire environment, right? But I think when you look at cloud native, your automation becomes more of a, an orchestration thought now instead of just automating tasks, right? And so um, when you're looking at the impact to your infrastructure, a lot of the things that you've automated might have been the right things to automate back on when the business was doing it that way. But now that you have a different model you're going after, you may have to orchestrate more of these different tasks in a different way. And so take a look at your automation environment. Take a look at the things you've done with orchestration in the past because orchestration, even though Kubernetes is a different way of doing orchestration, we've all been using orchestrators for our whole careers, right? So we. They're not really Kubernetes based, but they're a different model for how you orchestrate different services to run at different times. And so um, there's going to be an impact to how you look at your existing orchestration layers as well. And then I think probably the, you've heard this many, many times, but that API and how you look at your APIs of your infrastructure is really important because part of that, um, that CI CD for the infrastructure I mentioned earlier is having you know, very well defined standards around. What are the interfaces that you're going to write to below you and you're going to publish northbound for the business to leverage when they want to deploy their services into your infrastructure? And so that's sort of like at the, the top of mind things I thought about for like the infrastructure impact. When it comes to defining business services, um, I kind of break it into these three areas. Um, the first one is application composition. And so you're going to hear the business use these type of terms to say that and they're going to build a new application com composition framework. And what that basically means is they're going to take the traditional interior architecture and they're going to break it into smaller service chunks with functionality. And they're going to say these functions need to communicate across these different environments. And so um, the way I try to look at this is to create a blueprint of this application model, right? And so I'll show you in a second an example of this. but. Um, all these different services are going to be running on something. And so you want to kind of understand what that layer is that they're running on, whether it's in your infrastructure or whether it's on a public cloud somewhere. Um, you're going to have to be able to monitor and manage this environment in a similar way that you always have. So what's the impact to your OSS systems with these new services? Are you going to manage them on a, on a component by component level? Or are you going to try to group the components together and do more of a service-by-service service monitoring level. Um, 
And the same thing with your back office systems, right? You're going to need to be able to do things like billing and remediation and, and kind of understanding what the impact is to a service outage, right? And who gets impacted and how do you manage that impact? And so you can't forget those underlying systems that you've been depending on. And then um, there's this, this, I have this I concept that I've been trying to push into the industry called application um, services that are common and, and should be common. And so something like identity management to me is a service that everyone needs an identity management service. So I think part of your job in the infrastructure is trying to create, if you will, kind of service level um, businesses that you can then expose to your business to say, why don't you use these services? So I could think of routing as a service, right? You could think of you know security monitoring as a service. And so many, many companies have sort of outsourced a lot of these different components to you know cloud providers or to security services in the industry. But I think as an IT environment or as admins and architects of your environment, you could think about ways to kind of build a service that you then would offer out to your business to say, use this service and we'll help you manage your different application components in your new cloud native model by, by leveraging these common services. So I, I try to think about these different things that are like business process related that are probably still in um, rudimentary systems with most of your companies that you could then automate a lot of these things with um, you know, some of the software development things we're gonna talk about with Kubernetes that allow you to sort of offer business processes as a service. And so what does this, this application blueprint look like? So um, I like to kind of talk about microservices in terms of functions because it's not, um, I like to joke with people, you don't want to create nano services and pico services, right? You're trying to create microservices. And so, so how big is micro? Well, it's just big enough that you can kind of keep this, this piece of software running independently and scaling independently but it can't be so small that you have dependencies within that microservices. They have to like talk to each other and depend on other services all the time, right? Um, and so the whole point of a microservice or of a, a cloud native application is to look at your application architecture and break it into functions that can coexist and can live independently. And then these functions can scale up on their own. So you start with sort of those functions and then I kind of look at what I call these dependent services, right? So I, in this example, I said authentication as a, is a service that I'm gonna use from somewhere else. I'm not gonna build authentication into all of my individual functions, because then what I've done is I've replicated a small microservice, and I've said I'm gonna add that microservice to all my other microservices. And so you kind of break out authentication as a separate service, and only one of my microservices is gonna leverage that that microservice and the other ones would just basically be built underneath the systems and not care about authentication. So if you can kind of break your microservices into functions that one may care about authentication, the others may not have to, right? And then underneath that, there's some external services that I'm trying to represent as like service D and service E. And so this could be like databases, this could be like a message queue, this could be a Kafka bus of some kind, right? So. So this could also be like, you know, using Amazon's um, Lambda service could be like Service D, for example. So this doesn't, this isn't dictating that this sits within the same data center environment or even in the same server platform. This could represent services that you're getting from a cloud provider or from other um, internal IT systems that may or may not be containerized, right? Um, and so you kind of take this application that's broken into these three functions, you, ex, you know, try to connect with external services or internal services, and then you sort of look at then, the next piece is how do I integrate with my, my support and monitoring systems, right? How do I leverage the internal services that I'm connecting to, and I leverage every day to run the business, right? Because this is something that I can tell you most developers don't understand how to use or how to connect with, and are, are frustrated greatly every day because they try to deploy something and the, an issue happens and they're like leveraging a completely different system than the IT support desk is using. And so bringing those two worlds together is important. Um, and same thing with like your BSS systems, right? So by creating APIs, like I mentioned earlier, kind of um, abstracting these different internal systems that you leverage in the business and you leverage in your support systems 
and providing API interfaces to them is, I think, a great, a great benefit that IT and, and network in, admins and network architects can provide to the, server, to the business because it, it's basically taking something that is very difficult today in the business that the developers have to deal with and abstracting it for them and giving them an interface to hit against. And it, it fits their architecture because now they have a set of services that they will call into with an API versus having to connect from point A to point C on something and ask IT to create a path and open up a firewall port to allow them to communicate through here. And then they have to change the port number a few days later and they have to ask for a ticket to be open to change the port number. And so if you create an abstraction layer and give them a, a service to hit, it doesn't matter what interface they use to get that service, you've just secured yourself behind the firewall and you're giving them just data through the service that's already been authenticated. So it's, it's a much easier model. And then being that it's cloud native, you have to replicate that because you want multiple instances of this, right? And, and I only did it once because of, you know, wanting to make sure I had the right amount of room on the wipe on the presentation. But the whole point of this blueprint is you can just stamp this out multiple times in multiple locations, right? And so, you know, the, the rule of, of the cloud native development world is that I, I start with this on my laptop and I have all these interfaces, I have all of these services running as containers on my laptop. I tested it, I test the orchestration, I test the provisioning, I test the deployment, and then I go and I deploy this on my internal infrastructure, I can deploy this at Amazon, I can deploy this in any cloud, and it's to be exact same services running in the exact same way with the exact same orchestration. And this helps like decrease the amount of testing time that your developers have to do. It helps decrease the amount of support calls that you're going to get or issues you're going to get with networking and security concerns because you basically built all of your policies into this framework and you can just deploy it multiple times. So when it comes to deployment, um, you know, I think it's, we think about the way we just described those services being composed. Um, those services have to be thought about in terms of individual building blocks, not as the overall service. And so as you think about how you're composing those services, it's important that you create them in a way that they can each be orchestrated independently and can scale out independently. And so um, in the example I'm going to show in a few minutes, like a shopping cart is different than like an ordering system, right? And so don't put them together, keep them as separate services. And then within the shopping cart, you can have like all your services running to give you like what's in the, the current shopping cart, how you buy something, you know, how you remove something from the shopping cart. All of those services can be part of the shopping cart instance, but you don't need to move into the catalog and change your catalog because the catalog has nothing to do with the shopping cart, right? Now, obviously, you have to have something in the catalog to order before it shows up in the shopping cart, but you don't need to change your shopping cart features just to add something new to your product catalog. And so you kind of separate those two things. They have some relationship that's loosely coupled, but you can kind of keep them as separate services. And now if I have a lot of people hitting this, the website and the product catalog is a very static set of, of, of services, it's not going to need to scale up or scale down, right? It's very static. But if I have a lot of people buying stuff, that shopping cart is going to get hit very heavily. And it's going to be updating quantities and types very rapidly. And so I may need to scale that shopping cart service up drastically at times and hit the peak load. And then when it, the peak load's gone, serve it, you know, let it automatically scale back down. And that's where like cloud native and things like Kubernetes with the orchestration help because it lets you sort of um, scale up independent services from each other. And then when it comes to the deployment considerations, I think this is sort of the, the key thing with cloud native is it's not tied to any one specific set of primitives underlying infrastructure, right? And so you should be able to run this on bare metal. You should be able to run this in you know, a VMware environment. You should be able to run this in an OpenStack environment. You should be able to run this on Amazon, on Google, on Azure, you know, on your own private cloud of whatever flavor you've created, right? And so. Um, a key part of your software development, even in the infrastructure development side, like I mentioned earlier, is the application developers are trying to develop this in a way that they've abstracted all the underlying physical and commercial aspects of software, right? They don't even care what operating system they're running on in most cases, right? If you tell them they have to run on like Red Hat, they will, but they don't really care about what the operating system is. They're doing everything above the operating system level. And so for the most part, they can go with whatever you tell them to go with as long as you abstract away 
anything that's specific to an operating system or to a vendor's, you know, like, like they don't want to use Amazon APIs. They want to use Kubernetes APIs. And so they're kind of, you know, at the point now where the business is saying, let's not get locked into even Amazon or even to, to Google. We want to use their infrastructure because it's cheapest and it's fastest and it has all these capabilities. But we're going to standardize on the Kubernetes layer, and that's what we want you to write to. And so it helps you kind of move your applications as you need to and as the business needs to move them any way you want. And so when you look at the different scenarios, uh, it's, it's important from an application development standpoint. Your developers want to be able to deploy this code wherever it makes sense to the business to deploy it. And so it could be a private cloud. It could be on the public cloud. And it could be in a combination of the two because, again, most applications have dependencies on data that's inside your business. And so they have to get access to databases and things that sit inside your business. And so you want to make sure that they have the ability to kind of go both ways and not force them into one solution or the other. Let them have choice in what they deploy. And you know, again, the big focus is really on these APIs and on the orchestration layers, not on the underlying physical platforms. So that's sort of like the main thing for like cloud native. I'll get into a demo in just an example in a few minutes. But I want to kind of take a step back and talk about open source a little bit because I think it's um, it's something that I I went through the whole Linux transformation you know 20 years ago. But it this seems to be much different in in the Linux world because um, most of these um, open source projects are much smaller and have a, a much smaller audience behind them and a much smaller development organ, organizations behind them than what Linux had. And so um, open source is really where innovation is happening right now. It's where a lot of these communities are just springing up and they're kind of going after these very specific problems. And they're solving them in a way that is very innovative and very like um, enticing to the businesses, business developers to take and leverage, right? Um, and so the, when you look at what you can do in, with a vendor or what you can do on your own, it's very hard, I think, to justify not using open source today. It, it wasn't so hard many years ago because there was no support. There was, you know, you didn't, there was not a lot of security in place. It wasn't really, you know, you'd much rather go with somebody you could, like, you, you say, I know this vendor, they're going to support me. But the speed of, of technology changes today and the, how fast developers are adopting this technology it's already in your environments, probably. And it's probably very pervasive in your environments. And so I think it's important that you sort of look at how do you get involved in that. Um, there's a lot of power in community effort. And the way that the open source projects are run now, um, they have very high quality. They have a lot of security um, code reviews as part of their de development process. Um, they've implemented CI CD pipelines as part of the project. and so. If somebody pushes in a, a new update into an open source project, it goes through a Garrett review as part of that check-in process. And it goes through a deployment set of tests as part of the deployment of that code into GitHub. And then when you go to leverage that code, you're getting something that has had lots of eyes and lots of hands testing it and looking at it. So it's a much stronger community than it used to be. Um, the other thing that's nice about open source is it's very transparent, right? So if you if you want to know what the issues are, you just click on the issues tab, and then you see all the issues that people have had up to that point with the project. If you have an issue, you just do a you know hit the issues tab and hit plus, and you add your issue to it. Um, if you want to request a pull, you know some type of a change, you can do a pull request, and hey, I would like to see this capability added, and that gets uploaded, and then you see them responding to that pull request and answering like we don't want to do this for this reason or this is a great idea you know we're going to categorize it as for this release and we're going to start working on it now right and so it's very open you know why people like your idea or don't like your idea and you can give feedback to them right away um, and i think the to me what i'm seeing now and it's um, i think it's still early days so it's not something that you're like late to the game on. But I think that open source will become a very key part of not just, it's already a big key part of the business's strategy, I think. But when it comes to our role as infrastructure admins, it's going to be a big part of our strategy in the future is how do we adopt this? How do we en enable this quicker in our environment? And so with that, I'm going to switch over to a, um, to a demo. It's not, not 3D printers, sorry.
But this is a, um, a, a quick demo we did um, a couple of months ago where this is trying to represent a shopping experience where you have uh, some kind of web servers that are, we have four microservices that, that make up the web front end. We have four microservices making up the catalog piece. Uh, we have four for the cart and four for the account. And so this is sort of like, a, this is running on, on three different servers. Um, we, you'll see in a few minutes we kind of set up policies so that we would deploy, um, each of these services would run on different physical servers. So if we lost a physical server, we didn't lose like the entire business logic. Right? We just lost a small piece of it that would then replicate and spin out somewhere else. So, um, so we have these different environments set up. Um, the communication, as you can see, between them is, is pretty open. Um, where you're basically allowed to, you know, each area is allowed to talk to the other area. Um, most of the communication goes from the, you know, the uh, catalog to the front end, the account to the front end. We built this in Golang. Um, this is a, like a little composed interface we created. Um, so there's like four different um, services, one for front end and three, one for each of the other services. Um, you can log, look at these guys and um, basically what we're doing here is showing the, um, this server here is basically building for staging and we can click on it and log into it and see what it's um, going to show us. And so when I click on the, the staging button, it's going to take me to a website that, sh that shows what it looks like. But first I'm going to show you the configuration. Um, and so we've, we've kind of set up some keys on the environment envi area. So one of the things about having programmable infrastructures is that you can sort of create different types of, um, kind of think of them like database values, right? You can kind of create like key value pairs that let you define specific things about your application that you care about, right? And so in this case, we're kind of tying some of these account things to specific um, aspects within the different microservices. So we kind of, in this example, we're showing how an application can actually leverage values and get data from other microservices that it's not running within. So this is, is running inside of a, um, this exact, the, the server we have here is showing the front end. And so the front end is able to get data about the different services, the different catalog components, and the different account information. But it's not able to um, spin up any services, it's just able to get some information back from those, those services, which is interesting from a cloud native development standpoint. Um, and you can see we have it saying deploy one you know, container per host. So when I click on the button, it, it let me log in um, to the, um, to kind of look at the catalog of what's available to buy. Um, and in this example, we just created these three little products. Um, you click the add to cart and it just, you know, it, it lets you add it to the cart when you buy something. We're going to show you the code now that kind of sat behind this. The, um, the environment variables are like very basic Golang code. So each product has its own name. It has a, you know, the account, the account that you could add to the cart, the cost of it. So you can, you could change these at any time and just do an, you know, update your catalog in real time. Um, if you click on cart, it's going to take you to the, to the shopping cart. And now this is a different microservice, even though you don't realize that because you're just going through your experience of buying something. And you can add things, you can remove things. Um, and the, sh the cart will update in real time, but again, it's, it's not having to go back and talk to the catalog to find out what the catalog is doing, right? So it's all independent of the catalog. Um, and it's, it's, its main function is just to let you remove or add, you know, remove things or tie things back to it. Um, and so that's sort of the, the power of like developing the cloud native applications. It's very simple. It, it kind of separates functions out into separate entities and it lets you sort of run them in a way that is, is, uh, is very simple and very straightforward. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, you learned a little bit and um, I'd like to take any questions now and if you want to just talk with me afterwards, I'm available afterwards too. So thank you all for your time. Do you have a question or you just, no? Okay. Yeah.
I'll just repeat it. <laughs> right. Good. Good question. So the question is, how do you what do you do? How do you consider data? Is a database part of each microservice? Is a data separate? Um, and that's the answer to that question is it depends. And so, um, and, and there's sort of three use cases I like to think about. Um, the, the easiest way to address that question is to think about data in the way we think about data today as a separate set of services that are probably not going to be containerized, right? Because most of us have databases that are Oracle or SQL or some big, large database. You're not going to try to containerize it. And so if you're using sort of your traditional database model, that's a separate set of monolithic services, if you will, that sits off to the side. If I go back to that blueprint picture, um, I kind of consider um, in, in your example, I would consider a, data, a database to be sitting down here, probably inside your data center behind the firewall as a completely separate set of what I call a service you're trying to access, right? Now, the good thing about databases is that they have great APIs. And so you don't have to really try to API enable your database. It's already there, right? Um, so this, the second use case then is if you're doing an application from scratch, you don't have to rely on your existing database, then you could make one of these functions your database. And then you have to decide if it's a persistent store or if it's a non-persistent store, right? And, and if it's non-persistent, it's very easy because you don't have to worry about maintaining that data, right? It, it's there in the moment and then it's gone. Um, if it's persistent, then you have to think about what kind of storage you're going to use in the back end. And most of the time, you're using object storage, which isn't the most performant. And so if you have performance issues and you're using a microservices architecture with persistent data, you're going to have to make some tough decisions around object store versus you know, RDBMS or some kind of like you know, React or some type of a, you know, MySQL sort of database that's a little bit more complicated at that point. And then the third use case I like to talk about is if you look at these services being cloud services, in some cases you can look at leveraging something like you know, S3 from Amazon and some of its database as a service functionality they provide within S3, and you can just leverage a cloud service for your database. So then you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. You don't have to build it into your microservice. You don't have to maintain something that's expensive in your data center. But now you're pushing like your data that you care about into some service that's in the cloud, and that's a security concern, right? So, so those are kind of the three ways I think about databases and data in general. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so the question is, what are the limitations of a microservices architecture? Um, I think the obvious uh, limitations, to me at least, are anything that requires um, very high performance, very high speed sort of transactionals. Um, anything that requires a lot of um, hardware acceleration type of solutions. Um, so it, when you think about you know, microservices, you're trying to make something smaller. Now, Having said that, you know, I would have told you 15, 20 years ago that routers would never have virtual routers inside them, right? So um, you, could, you, could, you said like transcoders, right? They're probably like, you know, I, I know of a couple of cable companies in the US that are taking their, their very large transcoding systems and they're making them into smaller microservices and trying to run it. Um, I won't say they have good performance, but they're, they're trying to get there. Um, but I think what we see at Cisco a lot is um, IoT is a great use case for, for, um, for containers because you have um, these devices all over the place and you're looking at very small workloads in general, right? So doing, doing like a fog layer, doing a small set of um, mobile apps that run within these container environments, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of... Um, a lot of our businesses, like our UCS business, are trying to make Kubernetes just a, a part of the UCS deployment, right? So you can, you can basically spin up a UCS cluster and make Kubernetes the cluster manager for that UCS cluster, right? So more of a, it runs on 
UCS more than a UCS being containerized, right? And so, um, and if you look, if you talk with our COS team or you talk with the you know the ACI team, right? They're all doing something similar. We have they have a software plugin that plugs into Docker, or plugs into Kubernetes, and lets you extend what you're doing in the physical world into this container world and allow you to transfer policies over. So, so there's a lot of things that this does work well for, but it, it's it's definitely not something that everything will fit into, and um, a lot of a lot of the, the the pitfalls I've seen people make is they try to move to this right away, and just say we're going to basically stop what we're doing and move everything to this new model. And as you know, um, as I'm sure all of you guys know, as your application developers built their applications, there are things inside your firewall that they depend on, and they kind of forget about that, right? So they go to deploy this in Amazon, and they they do a request to the database and it fails. And they're like, why is it failing? And then you go, well, you're not connecting back to the database, so how's it going to work? You know? <laughs> or, they, or they do have a connection back to the database, but it takes you know, five seconds because they, they deploy this in you know, Australia and the database is sitting in you know, New York somewhere and it's going a wrong way around the world to get there. So it's crazy stuff like that I've seen them do a lot of. So the one of the things you guys can do when, when you're looking at this architecture with the business is helping them understand the internal dependencies that they have and how they would leverage and manage those dependencies versus ignoring that these, these, these dependencies exist and letting them just go off and deploy things and not know what's, what's going on. So, great. Well, thank you guys all for your time. Thanks for the great questions.